as your career develops, you will find people that resonate with you on a certain level. And it's maybe the word is mentor, maybe the word is collaborator. It kind of Mm -hmm. depends. And eventually they blend together as you sort of progress. But those people you just have to be on the lookout for. Hello, everyone. You are in for a treat today. We have a very special guest, Dr. Perry Wilson today, and I'm sure you will learn so much from this conversation. Briefly, Dr. Wilson is a nephrologist, just like I am. He's an associate professor at Yale University and a very distinguished researcher. So he has multiple research grants, close to 200 paper publications. And on top of that, He has his YouTube channel, The Methods Man, and he appears on various news channels to give breaking news about medical updates. And now he has just published a new book, How Medicine Works and When It Doesn't. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for coming to this channel. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Wonderful. Okay, I want to get deep into the beginning. Okay, if you can, can you tell me and also the audience about the medical research journey? How did you go from medicine to research? Sure. I mean, it was rather organic. I didn't do a PhD or anything before med school. I don't have a PhD now. You don't need a PhD to do medical research. It started really just with the curiosity you develop on the wards when you're seeing patients in the hospital. And particularly as someone who's always been interested in nephrology, I was a numbers person. I was looking at blood chemistries and things like that. And you start to notice patterns that can be intriguing to you, you know, and if you're that type of person who gets curious about the patterns you see in in numbers and patient outcomes, it sort of leads you down the path. And I did when I was a senior resident at the University of Pennsylvania, my first what you would call research study, which was looking at individuals on continuous dialysis, continuous renal replacement therapy, and predicting their outcomes, including death. And there was something immensely satisfying about translating those individual one-on-one patient encounters to like this larger truth. And that's how I sort of view the process of doing clinical research is that we all have our sense. We have the anecdotes that happen to us. We have our one-on-one patient experiences and we have a feeling for what we think might be true. And then Mm -hmm. that process of aggregating data to confirm that our beliefs are true, or what's even more exciting, to prove that our beliefs are not true, Mm, it was just immensely satisfying. And so after that kind of first very simple study, 100 patients, you know, abstracting data by hand from the medical record, I was sort of hooked and I ended up getting a master's in clinical epidemiology so I could do my own statistics and stuff like that. And it was sort of off to the races from there. Oh, I love this story. Yes, we start, we always forget, we go into medicine as doctors, we yep. start from the clinical side and then you ask more questions and you answer to find the truth. Right. And one thing you taught me that was really important is that you started a your own project as a resident. Is it something you came up by yourself or it was somebody who's like, oh, this is a good project where you go start doing it? How did you approach that? Well, this one was, I mean, the answer, I guess, is both. Although the idea was myself. I don't want to get too technical because I assume they're not you know, not the entire audience is nephrology fellows, but these are very sick patients that we were seeing that are on continuous dialysis in the hospital. Mortality rates are north of 50%, so pretty Mm -hmm. bad. And I had just, by taking care of them, had noticed that one parameter I had a feeling seemed to predict their outcome, a blood parameter. And this was something that, like, I hadn't seen written about really before, and had that kind of gut check. And, but then you do need the mentorship. So I went to Jeff Burns, who's uh, the program director at nephrology at UPenn at the time. And I said, you know, have you ever thought about this? And he said, yeah, that's a good point. He sort of pointed me, he's like, well, why not, you know, write a protocol and collect the data and find out. And so it really was a collaboration. Although I think there is something useful if you're actively seeing patients, if you're at that stage in your career, where you know you're seeing tens of patients, dozens of patients more a day, you have real clinical insight there that can lead to some really interesting questions. And coming up with your own project can be really fruitful. But if you're not at that stage, you know you're a graduate student or even an undergraduate student where you just don't, you haven't had that clinical experience yet. You, you may need to sort of be led down the garden path, and that's fine. That's fine too. That can be really good too. Wonderful. So I also heard a few things. First is that you had some mentorship and you approached the mentor. So I want to find out from you, how do you typically find mentors for yourself in through your research and medical career? I think there are two main ways. A good program 
that an academic medical program should facilitate finding you a mentor? It's a good question to ask as you're thinking mm -hmm. about where to go to medical school or where to do residency, if that's your career, you know, they should have formal structures in place to match mentees and mentors. I was lucky enough to go to places that did, you know, basically like, here's your mentor and you guys need to go and have coffee and work <laughs> it out. That said, as your career develops, you will find people that resonate with you on a certain level. And it's maybe the word is mentor, maybe the word is collaborator, it kind of mm -hmm. depends. And eventually they blend together as you sort of progress. But those people you just have to be on the lookout for. They're people who you want them to be smart. You want them to understand what you're talking about. You want them to be sort of giving of their time and interested in you. And ideally, you want the work that you do to benefit them as well. In, in the end, it's great to have a mentoring relationship that's bilateral, that the way they help you also helps them, that it advances their research career as well. I've found quite a few people in diverse fields, not just nephrology, but you know, I've got someone in cardiology that, while not a formal mentor, is someone I bounce all my ideas off of before I get too deep into them. I've got a PhD biostatistician that I've found that we just really gel and have collaborated on multiple projects. And I consider him sort of a, at least a biostatistics mentor, although he might consider me a clinical research mentor in terms of getting patients into studies. So you be, you know, organically and inorganically, but mentorship is important. You need multiple. Right. I love the way you describe sometimes it's not just mentor mentee, but it's actually mentor collaborator. And this is a very important distinction for the audience because sometimes I get a lot of emails from undergrad or even high school students. Oh, will you be my mentor? The gap is too far that it's difficult to mesh well because you don't know what I'm going to talk about. So if you have a mentee who is who's not even medical school yet and you want to do clinical research, it's difficult to give you guidance because there's so much foundation to build. So for people who are at beginning stages, somebody who is more structured, maybe assigned from your school, but as you grow, you actually have to find levels that are more on par with where you are. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. Absolutely. Do you have any, what about the flip side? What do you look for when deciding whether you should take someone in as a mentee? Putting you on the spot here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, th there's a lot of things. I, I think the number one thing is to get a sense that they are, you know, passionate about this line of work. You know, I appreciate, I'm a realist. I know that some of this sort of, Process. I know people come to the lab to buff up their CVs so that they can get into medical school or get a better residency. Like I, I'm aware that, that happens, but I do try to look for people that seem to have that sort of spark of interest who are willing to not just necessarily do what's asked of them, but to look a step deeper and try to gain further insights and to innovate on the tasks that they're given. So it's not just I'm an undergraduate student doing chart abstraction, which is fine, you know, valuable and a good way to get your foot in the door if you've never done any research before. But hey, while I was doing chart abstraction, I noticed X, Y, and Z. That kind of extra effort really goes a long way with me. And then each lab has needs. And so I'm oftentimes I'm looking for people that might fill a niche that we don't have. Like currently... I'll, I'll say like, I'm on the lookout for someone who's really good with data visualization. Like we have a good machine learning person. We have some good biostatistician people, some epi people, but like, I've always felt like we need someone who's just got that spark for taking data and making a nice picture out of it. And, you know, as people come by, I may ask what their experience is. I actually had someone apply that was a biochem major in undergrad and a, like an art minor. It's like, oh, <laughs> That could work really well. Yeah. So you never know exactly which of your skills might be sort of necessary and they might not, ne they might not be scientific, but it certainly helps. You know, the more background someone has, my lab's very data focused. So, you know, people with statistics backgrounds, computer science backgrounds are attractive because I can kind of start them at a higher level. They can contribute in a deeper way, but there's levels to contribute no matter what your prior experience is, which is really important. As I said, sometimes your contribution is talking to patients and telling them about a study and seeing if they'll consent or not, you know, and that's fine. That's a great way to get started. Absolutely. Right. When you say talking to patients, the recruitment is actually the most difficult part. Yeah. Taking <laughs> time and sitting down, having good rapport with people. So don't downplay all the transferable skills, like the regular people skills and drawing skills. Usually. We need everything in research. <laughs> 
Yeah, so, in, in so, clinical right. research, especially those people yeah. skills are so critical. And I always, I would say, I'm jealous of you know my colleagues who work with mice or fruit flies because you know <laughs> they can't say no and they show up on time. But it's a privilege to work with patients, and but it's much more complicated. Right. Right. Okay, so I want to shift gear now to your read book, How Medicine Works and When It Doesn't. So duck through the first part. And what I really love, yes, bring it up. Show it up. <laughs> I just like to show it up for a longer cool. time. Yes, I'll put in the link later. <laughs> what I really love about this book was how real it felt, especially the story about you and the first patient. And you thinking you could help, but ended up not helping. Tell us why did you start writing this book? Yeah, so this is a book for not for medical people. It's really a book for the sort of what you know, the lay public, I guess you could call it. I started writing it because of the proliferation of medical misinformation that is out there, you know, online, offline, all around us, more now than ever before. And because of the mistrust in the system that engenders. And I wanted to teach people without maybe a scientific background, like how to evaluate data in a way to make informed decisions, how to know what's real and what's fake and what's likely to be true and what's not. But the journey of writing the book really to be honest, opened my eyes to our own flaws within medicine itself. And I started to realize, you know, as I was doing the research for the book, that like one of the reasons people are susceptible to fraudsters online and the hype and, you know, alternative therapies that aren't proven mm -hmm. is because they feel like regular medicine, the stuff that we do, has failed them. And they're not wrong. We have to be honest about the ways that medicine, particularly in the United States, fails to meet the needs of our patients. There's several that, you know, there's a whole chapter in this book about insurance. There's a whole chapter in this book about the pharmaceutical industry. These are big problems, but it really goes deeper than that. There's an epidemic of social isolation in this country and loneliness mm -hmm. are concepts that are not really taught in medical school at all. And yet we see the effects of them, right? We've got rates of what are often referred to as deaths of despair, alcohol abuse, deaths from alcohol abuse, deaths from drug abuse, and suicides that are higher than they've ever been in history. And it's not even close. There's more suicides per year now than there were during the Great Depression. There's more drug overdose deaths by a factor of 10 than there have ever been before in the past year. And these occur in people in the, what, you know, you might call the prime of their life, ages 30 to 55 are sort of the hotbeds for these, these premature deaths. And what are we doing about that as doctors? You know, we're so focused on making a diagnosis and saying, oh, you're depressed or you're anxious and take this medication and that we're ignoring these broader societal problems, this fragmentation of society that's happening all around us and causing so much pain and suffering. And I think people who are experiencing that go to their doctor and get five minutes in the exam room. And maybe if they're lucky, get told that they're depressed. Did any wonder that they're looking to their Facebook friends and to random people on Twitter who are offering what seems like a much better solution, even if it's fake. And so the book ended up really casting, at, you know, there's a lot of blame to go around and why people have lost faith in medicine. It's not just that we're not great critical thinkers anymore, because the truth is humans have never been great critical thinkers. And there's a lot in this book about how to improve your critical thinking skills, no doubt. But it is also, there's plenty of blame for the medical establishment too. Right. We should look at medicine and whole society, not, not as bits and pieces, but as a whole. And you're right. It's not the patient's responsibility is not only the is everybody's responsibility. It's something is not easy, but it's something we all have to do together. So as doctors, we have to be more truthful and say, this is what we have, this is the evidence, and we can't do that, but also listen. And patients also need to start developing more. And perhaps eventually we can have a better connection with the healthcare yeah. provider. Yeah. We need to realize we're on the same side. Yes. Um, and and in, you know. In many ways, we're on the same side against disease, right? We both, like the patient, doctors, we all hate disease. We all hate suffering. That's great. But really, we're on the same side. Patients don't often understand this. We're really on the same side against the, your insurance company, too. <laughs> we're fighting with them. We're fighting with them quite a bit. We're on the same side against against the pharmaceutical companies as well, because we don't like prescribing medication. It doesn't benefit us to prescribe an expensive medication. We don't see any benefit from that. Like all it does is hurt our ability to help you. Bigger than that, 
70% of physicians in the United States are employees right now. So this idea that doctors are management, that they own a private practice and, you know, they're hanging out a shingle and running their own business, that is simply not true anymore. The vast majority of doctors that any patient's going to interact with are employees of a healthcare system. They are not in charge of their time. They are labor, not management. Mm -hmm. They're treated like labor. They're treated like factory workers. And doctors have to start realizing that like we have more in common with the factory worker on our clinic table than we do with the executives in the C-suite of our hospital system. And, you know, I think as hopefully younger generations of doctors start to realize that, that like we need to advocate for ourselves and for our patients the same way labor has advocated for itself for a long time, that's the way that things might get better. And so I, you know, I do talk about how to do a doctor's strike in this book. Um, <laughs> ethically, and I'll clue you in because it's obviously not ethical for us to stop taking care of patients who are sick. We can't just walk off the job, mm -hmm. right? You know what we can do? We cannot enter billing codes when we finish seeing a patient. Right. We can, and we, there are things like that where we can actually take care of the person, but in a rigorous way, make our needs known to the health system really quite easily. And I'd like to see people start talking about that a little bit more. And we'll see if I have a job after this airs or not. <laughs> I don't have tenure yet, so I still get dropped. And maybe I should wait until, uh, until I have tenure to say this stuff. As doctors, students who are in this channel, you know, as we go into medicine, you have to not just see what the shiny thing looks like. You know, it's not just a prestige. You want to know what it is like the day-to-day -day work to know how it is actually, how it actually is, because there are burnout happening because mismatch expectation. You thought you're going to medicine for this, but it ends up being, you have to be on the phone to call the prior auth insurance company for hours. You know, want to be really shadowing a doctor to see how the day-to-day -day life is before you jump into medical school. So I think that's general advice for all career that don't jump into something just because it sounds great. You want to see the lifestyle. Right. No, the, absolutely. And I mean, I'm happy to talk if anyone's interested about sort of the day to day of being a researcher slash physician. But yeah, it's not all it's not all, you know, pleasant Zoom interviews. <laughs> right. Actually, actually, let's do this. Tell, you know, tell us a day in your life. You know, what time you get up? What do you do? Well, okay, maybe not what time you get up. But, <laughs> you know, what's your day to day? So I, I, philosophically, I am one who does not believe in the like sort of grind mindset that I've seen at, certainly in a lot of researchers, you know, where the idea is that you'll be more successful the longer you work. I really don't think that, and I don't want that. And I've often told my mentees, like, look, I come, you know, I work my 40 hours a week. I try not to work more than that. When I'm on service, you're, I'm working a bit more than that. But you know, when I'm in the lab, that's what I try to do. I try never to send emails after hours or on the weekends when I feel that anxiety that I want to respond to an email or I want to get something out there while I'm thinking about it and it happens to be a Saturday or 8 p.m. at night, I will write it and then I'll delay the send until Monday morning so that I'm not burdening someone else on their weekend. So I really consciously try to have, you know, this work-life balance. I try to run three miles a day, at least five times a week. I find that sort of makes me more efficient afterwards. I, you know, make sure I have time for my kids on the weekends and stuff like that. And what I have told my mentees is like, if I fail because of this, if I, because of these decisions I've made that I can't get grants and I can't keep funding going and I can't get papers published, I can't get studies completed, then I didn't, I don't want to succeed in a position where the only way to have success is to sacrifice the rest of your life. And one of the nice things about being an MD who does research is that I have something to fall back on. Like I'm happy to see patients. I love seeing mm. patients and I can do that. And that's a luxury I appreciate that not everyone has. But I think if, you know, I spend a lot of my life delaying gratification, you know, working hard in college and in med school and, you know, studying the long hours and trying to get a good internship and residency and fellowship and so on and so forth. But, and it, but I've realized now that you can delay your gratification forever. There's always more to, there's always more work to be done. The inbox is never empty. You can always try to push harder and harder, but I've sort of consciously made the decision that like, I'm at a point in my life, I've got my family. They're really important to me. And I, 
if I can't succeed and be a good husband and father, then I don't want to succeed. Then the, it's the system's problem. It's not my problem. And something about that is liberating. We'll see how I it works out. I love this. And what I really got out of this was the intentionality. Like you have chosen and you made a decision. This is not because somebody put this on you, not just because some wellness programs say you have to work for it. You, you chosen and decide for yourself. Yeah. So I want to give a quick caveat here. Okay. People hear this like, oh, I should focus on work life balance. I work with Dr. Wilson. He is fast. When we send things are moving fast. So don't take your work life balance too far. You have to realize everybody goes on a different standard. Dr. Wilson gets things done in 40 hours. So if you need more time, means you need to learn the skill. And you may need to hustle a little bit at the beginning and delay gratification until you get to the skill level to do the same amount of things in 40 hours. So no, just I, one I, caveat there. It's, it, yeah, it's not for everyone. And it's taken me a while to get efficient in the certain tasks that I do, like writing and things like that. But again, these are that is something you can work on. So instead of feeling guilty that you're not working 80 hours a week, feel guilty that you're not writing, you know, a page every 10 minutes or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to chastise yourself for efficiency, not for duration, right? Work smarter, not harder. And sometimes it's that intentionality of the work-life balance that drives me to be more efficient, that mm -hmm. to procrastinate less. And I'll just say like, okay, like I've got one hour I have, I've got my, you know, to-do list here. You know, I've got one hour. I've got these three things I need to review. Like that is the time I have, you know, focus in, read them, edit them, send them back, et cetera. And I do spend a fair amount of time uh, or at least of mental energy sort of strategizing, okay, what needs to get done and when is my time to do it? And then making sure that I do it in that time, because, you know, again, I'm trying to make sure that I leave room for myself at the end. And that does mean kind of packing things a little bit. And that's a skill that you just develop with time. I love this because as you say, the more time you give, the more time you'll take. And so yeah, you yeah. have been very deliberate about constraints. That's the first thing. Second skill I heard you talking about is strategizing to do what, how you're going to do it, the process so that you get the efficient. So when you're listening to this, you can watch back again, you know, all the different nuggets that Harry has throw in there is the intentionality, all the different skill sets and strategy that you need to be able to achieve that while having a life that you want. Yeah. I'll give you one more because it, yes. it's occurring me as you talk. The other thing that I'll do at the beginning of the day, I will set out sort of a criteria for like mini success. Like today is a successful day if, and usually I have like like, you know, in a video game, like you can have like one star, two star, three stars, like mm -hmm. you pass the level, like today is a success if some bar that I believe is achievable and it may, depending on the day, right? I'll look at my schedule and be like, oh my gosh, I have back-to-back -back meetings for six hours today. <laughs> like I'm going to consider it a successful day if I, you know, can add the sample size calculation to this grant. That's it. That's mm -hmm. if I can get that done today, it's a successful day. And then I'll usually have like, and if I can get to these other two things, it's like bonus level points, right? And yeah, like mm -hmm. then I'm like, I really, you know, I was it was a really productive day. And it's gonna vary sort of from day to day. And to be honest, some days it's like, nope, nothing. Like this is a day that is a wash. I'm stuck all day doing X, Y, and Z and nothing can happen. But generally I'll try to say I at least need to get this one thing done. And what I've often found is like with that mindset, it might I might be two hours into the day and I'm like, oh, I did the thing. Like I, I did that sample size calculation, but I have those two other things. All right, let's see. And I'll tell myself, you know, tomorrow, I, if I do these things today, then they're off the list for tomorrow and that's even better. And so just small little achievable chunks and giving yourself permission to be proud of even like, I'm like proud of small achievements sometimes. <laughs> just like, like I filled out that damn faculty self-evaluation <laughs> survey that they sent that's like been sitting in my inbox. And like, right. that was my one thing to, I was like, if I can get that damn survey about like where I see myself in five years done, it's a successful day. And if in addition to that, I can update the protocol to version 2.0, it's like a really good day. And that's it. Wonderful. Thank you. I don't know. It's administrative work. It yeah. seems more difficult than any type of research. I, I don't know why every time I have an evaluation for that, it takes me, oh, it's so painful. I'll take cover. I can't do it. 
but yes, that is a win. I would think that is a win. Yeah, yeah. Put on the win list. At least then yes. you get you can pat yourself <laughs> on the back for finishing. You know, your wellness survey that like is giving you more stress than any <laughs> yeah, other yeah. thing. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. All right. Do you have any final advice for aspiring academics? One tip that you think I wish I knew when I was younger, and I'll do this now. Um, yeah, you'll fail more than you succeed. I have two folders in my grants folder. So I have a folder that says funded exclamation point, And I have a folder that says dead. And I put the funded grants in the funded folder and I put the dead grants in the dead folder. And the dead folder is now like four or five times bigger than the funded folder. And you know, I've done okay. Like I've done fine. A lot of people going into research, you know, these are smart people. You're the top of your class. You score really well on tests. You've got, you know, an analytic mind. You've done the coursework, you know, the, you know, you're, you know how to use the software. You're still all of a sudden gonna, you know, get denied. Some of you, it'll be the first time in your life. Part of this is because it, it's a whole new skill set that you have to learn. Part of it is dumb luck. Like people don't realize, you know, it's just other human, when you're submitting a grant or a paper for publication, it's just some other human on the other yeah. end. You don't know if they had a fight with their spouse the night before, if they had their cup of coffee yet or not, or if they just read the best grant they've ever read in their life and you're the next one, or they worse. Right. Like all this stuff, this is a stochastic process. And all you can do is put your best foot forward and take your shot. And if it doesn't work, you try again. And you know, get ready for that. The, I think that the line I kind of keep coming back to is like, if you can't control the outcome, you best enjoy the process. You can't really control the outcome of how your grant gets scored. It's just dependent on too many things. Or if your paper gets published, you best enjoy the writing of it, the thinking about it. If you don't, if you didn't enjoy collecting that data and analyzing it for your own self, and all you care about is getting that paper published, it's not, you're not going to enjoy this because most of your time is not getting papers accepted. Most of your yeah. time is writing and formatting and <laughs> analyzing. And then the next biggest chunk is getting papers rejected. And then it's getting papers accepted. And if that's all you can look forward to, you're in for a world of pain. Yeah. Yeah. I Like what you said, the most of the time is writing. I think writing the most Data collection, even less time because you, know, you, you get people to recruit for you. Really, it's a lot of time of thinking with a project. Yep. Trying to answer. And, then and that's the, the fun literature. part. Like the yeah. fun part for me, <clears throat> honestly, there's two really good parts of a study. There's the time when we, we get up at the white, before we've written anything and the team gets in front of a whiteboard and we kind of talk about the question, like what's interesting and, we're drawing and we're drawing arrows and we're trying to figure out like, okay, how do you test this? And can we randomize this? And, you know, how are we going to do this study? That's like really fun. That's a creative process. And then it gets boring as you're like putting the protocol together and it's mm -hmm. like, realize all the little problems and then you're kind of working through. That's a little bit boring. And then you start doing the studies. You're recruiting patients, you're meeting people, exciting again for a while. Then there's the lull as it's like, okay, we're just getting more data. And then there's this really exciting time when that data set is complete. And you're like, now we get the answer to that question. And that's awesome because you get the answer, you get more questions that you didn't even think of. That it leads to, it's a very exciting time. And then you put this together for the world to see in the form of a manuscript. And if you really believe in what you're doing and you think you designed a good study, writing those manuscripts is fun because you're showing off a little bit. You're saying like, you know, I thought about this a lot. I think we did a good job and here you go. And then you get, you know, rejection and then that, that feels pretty bad. But as, as long as you can enjoy those moments along the way, you'll be fine because um, you'll stick to it. And the people who do well are just people who stick to it. And eventually something you'll figure it out, like something, something will hit, but you got to be, you got to enjoy the process. Thank you so much. How can people reach out to you and where can we get the book? <laughs> you can get the book wherever books are sold. So you can go to your bookstores or obviously Amazon, Barnes and Noble, stuff like that. It's how medicine works and when it doesn't. I'm on some social media. I'm on Twitter at F. Perry Wilson. And my YouTube channel is also F. Perry Wilson. And I'm also on Instagram, but I'm not very good at Instagram. And my email is francis.p.wilson at yale.edu. If anyone wants to reach out to me that way. All right. Thank you so much for being here and such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Thanks, Jill.